SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. I'm really excited to hear about this topic we're addressing today and I'm thinking that they have hearings about uh, foreign interference in our elections right now in Ottawa and uh, I will not speculate on what our speaker is going to say but I'm thinking that artificial intelligence can uh, be used in many devious ways and probably also some good but I will let our speaker come and tell us about that. So please give uh, our speaker uh, a warm welcome, Sydney Sapiro. Hi everybody, thank you very much for having me. My name is Sydney Shapiro. I'm an assistant professor at the Dillon School of Business at the University of Lethbridge and I teach courses about AI, I build AI systems. When the AI takes over, I'll be the only one to have a job, so I'm okay for a while. <laughs> and there's a lot of talk about what AI is, what it's not, how it works. It's a very hot topic, and I always wonder how many people put the words AI in their, um, in their job title over the past six months. It seems like suddenly everybody's become an expert and it's a huge thing. We'll talk today about what it is, but more importantly, what it's not and some of the ways that AI is being used. I think that there's some very big societal challenges. In the 1930s, there was this thing called an automat, and this was magical. This is a picture in New York City, and you put a quarter or a nickel at the time into a machine, and you press a button, and as if by magic, food comes out of the other side. And people thought, this is amazing. This is such advanced technology. Now, in reality, there was a kitchen behind this little window, and when you put the nickel in, somebody gave you a slice of pie and then pressed the button, you opened it, but it appeared by magic, right? People thought this was amazing. And we're kind of in that era now, where people think that AI can do amazing, magical things, and we'll talk about how it actually works, maybe some of the, the, the um, technology behind it, and. I think that although people think that it's going to change everything and it's going to be this huge transformative technology, in some cases that's true and in others, not so much. So if you remember in Star Trek, they had this amazing thing where you could talk to the computer, right? And the computer talks back to you. And that very simple idea, this came out in the 60s, and if we think about it until today, that technology doesn't actually exist. We have things like Alexa and Siri, which kind of do that, but not at a way of understanding you on an emotional level, right? They can't really understand you as a person. But you can talk to this technology, and what people are very excited about now are things like ChatGPT, where you can talk to it and it seems to talk back to you, right? So maybe we are at this Star Trek level of technology where suddenly we could have real conversations with computers. So AI is not new and there's many different kinds of AI. The main thing that we're talking about today is generative AI that we'll get into. But the idea is that from the 40s and 50s, um, when they had the Enigma machine in World War II, they had to break codes. They needed to find pathways to do this faster and better. And essentially they built machines to do this. They built machines that would help figure out at many times what people can do, how to break codes, for example. And that's the idea of where it started, right? Building systems that were able to do math and able to figure things out a lot faster than people were able to. As we go forward and we start having more advanced technology, in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of rules-based methods. You've probably heard buy low, sell high. And if you could teach a computer to do that, that's what it would do at scale. Every time it sees an opportunity, it buys, then it sells. Of course, it doesn't understand the big picture. And that's really the most important part. If you don't understand the big picture of what's going on, inevitably, it's gonna make a mistake because it doesn't realize what else is happening in the economy or society. In the 80s and 90s, we start moving into things like machine learning and neural networks, which is basically creating new kinds of data, new kinds of programs that look at how to sort data together. So, for example, in the past 20 or 30 years, there's been this huge explosion on the internet of pictures. But pictures don't have any context, and computers had a very hard time understanding what the picture was about. 
Is it funny? Is it a picture? Is it a cat? Is it a boat? Or it could be something else. And without being able to organize that information, it makes it very difficult, and you've probably seen this if you look at ads on social media or on the internet. What are the ads about, and why are they showing the ad to you? And it's interesting that they're trying to pick up on the text on images, and they're trying to find out, okay, this is how we can group these people. These are the people really interested in boats. We're gonna show them boat pictures. And that idea is called machine learning, right? Trying to target advertising towards the people that it's used with. Now, there, are, there is AI used every day in many different ways. And what's happened more recently is that we are able to build new technologies like computer vision, so computers can see things and understand what it's looking at. In other words, if it looks at a picture, it can detect that there's a boat inside of it. Or, for example, there's technology that if you take a picture and you send it to Google, they can tell you where the picture was taken, like what you were standing in front of. And those kind of technologies, by matching up the images with Google Images, by looking at different technologies, we get into new territory where we're able to use much more processing in order to understand things a lot better. And computers can now come up with new and insightful things, but it's not actually intelligence, it's just new ways of trying to find information. And what's really changed in 2017 is this idea of transformers. Not that kind of transformers, the other kind. And the idea is that we can start to have words or sentences and put them together in a way where we could find out logically what comes next. And we'll talk a lot more about this, but essentially this is the basis of all generative AI. Right. So where we are right now are things like expert systems, like we talked about with trading, machine learning, supervised or unsupervised learning. That means that we're giving it examples to work from, like here's a thousand pictures of a cat, here's a new picture, is it a cat? And it can tell you if they match up or not. So if you were to describe an apple or an orange, it's actually quite difficult, right? So if you, I said to you, what does an apple look like? You would probably say it's round, but there's lots of things that are round. Or that it's red, the sun is round and red. And that's really difficult to tell a computer how to figure those out. And if you think about it, to really describe an apple, it's kind of round, it's bumpy on the bottom, it's kind of red or maybe green, and it, it could be so many other things that describing it by rules is very complicated. But if we show the computer thousands of reference images and say, this is an apple, if you ever see something like this in the future, you can detect it, suddenly that opens up many possibilities. Like for example, there's systems now that can tell if somebody's wearing a hard hat. So you walk up to the door, it, the computer looks at you and sees if you're wearing a hard hat, and if you are, it lets you into the job site. And if you're not, it keeps the door locked. How does that work? Because it has thousands of reference images of hard hats. And now machine vision is used in Lethbridge to detect license plates and send you a speeding ticket in the mail. It's used in many different places by using huge collections of references. So if we have thousands and thousands of examples of what this is supposed to look like, we can scale it out and then make it work in different contexts. Right? That's the idea. We have things like robotics, where instead of, again, writing thousands of instructions and telling the robot, here's how you make coffee. I'm sure everybody here has made coffee before. And if I said to you, how do you make coffee? It's probably something very simple, like you heat up the water, you pour it in the cup, put in the coffee, or you make the actual coffee, and then you're good. But the problem is that if you had to tell a robot how to make coffee, it would say, move five degrees, don't spill the coffee, move angle slightly, don't spill the coffee, put the water in the cup, but don't overfill it, use enough force to put down the cup, but don't crush it, and all these instructions, a robot who's never made coffee before really has to know. In fact, one simple act of making coffee that we do on autopilot, robots have to spend thousands of instructions thinking about, just like the Apple example. So by using AI, we could start to skip towards the end and figure out how could we basically say, here's where we start, empty cup, and here's the cup of coffee, and you figure out all the steps in between. That's called uh, reinforcement learning. There's also the idea of I'm um, training the robot using different techniques. In other words, to skip all those steps, because if somebody has to go and program step by step how it works, it would take thousands and thousands and thousands of instructions. Instead, we can skip that because we have a much larger set of instructions that we're pulling from. We're moving towards something at the bottom with natural language processing, where we have things like speech, speech of text, and text of speech. And also this idea of taking information and trying to classify it in different ways, trying to find answers from big pieces of text. And this is really what's changed now with ChatGPT, as well as other technologies that use generative AI, right? It's a brand new technology that uses transformers to try to understand speech. Speech is very complicated. In fact, if I said, 
how are you doing? And you said, wicked, it would probably be really bad in Lethbridge, but fantastic in Boston, right? Because people use language in different ways. How can the robot understand the context of what you're talking about it comes from very large data sets of hundreds of examples, right? Lots of examples that are out there that it can use as a reference. And a lot of people are very worried that AI is taking over the world, uh, like you see from Terminator, or that they say that AI is taking over human civilization, which obviously would be a very big problem. So there's basically a few different kinds of AI. So we have narrow AI, which is basically Here's a thousand resumes, which is a very common thing that everybody has. I want you to take that resume and create a new one based on this new information. That's easy to do because there's so many different examples. It's like having a thousand apples and describing a new apple. On the other side, people are worried, like in the previous slide, about this thing called general AI, where AI goes beyond just using text and it starts to figure things out at a much more advanced level. In fact, so much more advanced that it can program itself. Now the thing is, this actually doesn't exist. That's science fiction. People are worried about it and they're writing articles about it as if it existed today. It does not exist, it's not a real thing. So when people talk about AI, there are a lot of ways that AI impacts us. For example, if you use your credit card in the store, they'll look at does this purchase match with all the other purchases you've ever made? And if so, then it's fine. And if not, it's gonna set up an alert and say you just spent $13,000 on soda, that doesn't make any sense, right? They're gonna put on an alert. And that kind of AI we don't see, it just happens behind the background and it scans all of our transactions and looks at the model built around your data and extrapolates it. In terms of general AI that can be as smart as a person, there's no such thing, it doesn't exist yet, but maybe in the future with computers getting faster and larger and larger, more complex models, we could start to capture more of what happens and we could build better models. One of the big issues, um, that we have today is that a lot of AI that we're talking about, everything we've mentioned so far, is usually pictures or images or text, images or text. And the issue is that our lives are videos. I'm looking at you right now, you're looking at me, and that video has been playing our entire life, and we learn from that along with many other sensors. So we're able to feel things and touch things and taste things, and all that together forms this very complicated picture of what our lives are like. And that's the challenge, that we can't just take text and extrapolate that as being human existence, right? The supercomputer. And I think that that's something that's gonna take a lot of time to learn. So the idea of generative AI that people are talking about now is it's a new machine learning system that looks at patterns and relationships and it can build music, art, code, language, et cetera. Why? Because all those things exist in abundance. If I feed in thousands of pieces of art, I can say, based on the style of Chagall, make me a new painting, and a new painting comes out, right? Not necessarily because I was able to build a new one brand new, but it's extrapolated from everything else that it has. It's like a combination of all of them. Now, there's a lot of hype around AI, things like it's a $120 billion global market with a 20% growth rate. It's projected to reach $1.5 trillion by 2030. 35% of businesses use AI and 97% of people interact with AI every day, and so on, right? These are all claims that AI is huge and taking over the world and so on. And while there are a lot of places that use AI all the time, ones that we see and ones that we don't see, the reality is that it's not as expanding as quickly as we th people think because it's, you have to have people in the loop. You have to have people who are actually coming up with the original ideas. So large language models, this is the engine that runs them, this huge collection of text, billions and billions of words, work together and they could think in sentences or paragraphs and essentially they are huge autocomplete systems. If you tell it something, it will tell you what comes next. And by using the system, you could try to figure out what different patterns are. Now there are some big questions, like for example, we don't know why it chooses one pattern over another. We're not sure. And because of that, it means that there's a degree of randomness or creativity that exists within AI that makes it very difficult to know, is it telling the truth? Is it lying? Is it telling me something convenient? We don't know. And that's kind of a big issue. Now there are really good areas where this makes a lot of sense. For example, here's an example of an app where you're talking with a robot and you're saying, hi, I wanna check my order status. And then the robot says, sure, what's your order ID? And you say, where could I find it? And it says, oh, look on the message I sent you. These are all pre-programmed and they're a very predictable set of responses. If you were talking to a real person, you could say, oh, 
what do you think? Oilers or flames? I know, sorry. And it would tell you their opinion. But a robot can't. It's not programmed to work outside of its parameters. A company recently did an IVR system. So you call customer support, and you're talking to a robot. And the robot can answer certain questions that it's programmed to answer. However, if you ask any question outside of that, it transfers you to a real person. So in this company, Klarna, 70% of the people answering the phone have now become robots, but 30% of people are actual people that could answer anything. That's kind of the idea. The problem is that in this type of system, it works in very few industries that people, in many industries, people ask all kinds of things. Imagine you worked at a coffee store. People can come in and ask anything. Even for just coffee, they ask a thousand different questions. And you can't pre-program all the answers. You have to figure out that pathway to make them work. So it's important that despite ChatGPT or other large language models being very personable, they're not alive, they don't have feelings, they don't have understanding, and they're basically doing math, right? And we're going to take a look at that uh, idea. How does that work? So here's a totally AI-generated conversation. I said, I want a conversation between a proprietor and a customer. And the system told me, good afternoon. Could I have a slice of margarita pizza? And the proprietor says, good afternoon. Absolutely. One slice of pizza coming up. Would you like anything on it? A variety of toppings. The customer says, what toppings do you have? The proprietor says, we have mushrooms, olives, extra cheese, pepperoni, and many more. Each additional topping is 50 cents. The customer says, I'll have some mushrooms on top. The proprietor says, sure. Would you like anything to drink with that? The customer says, what drinks do you have? The proprietor says, we have soda, bottled water, freshly brewed iced tea. So I want you to think about this conversation for a second. It's an everyday conversation. The customer walks into the store. The store owner says something. In fact, let's go back a second. How many conversations do we have on autopilot? You see somebody, and you're like, hey, how are you doing today? And you're like, oh, great, how are you doing? That's not like you thought about it. That just happens, right? That was just like programmed in your brain. It just came out. Just like this conversation at the pizza store, if you were the pizza store owner, you'd probably have a 1,000 conversations like this every day. People come in. They ask for pizza. They ask for pizza prices. Your brain is an autopilot. Now, this is how it looks to the computer. On the left is all the words that we just said in that conversation, the proprietor talking to the customer. On the right are the codes for each one of those words. It's the same exact text, except that on the right, these are the numbers of, if I said word number one, followed by word number two, followed by word number five, the next one would be word number 13. They just go in a pattern, right? So this is the pattern on the right, and on the left, you can see each word and its corresponding code. And again, just think about it in your regular lives. We kind of work like that, too. If I said, hey, how are you doing today? You would automatically respond with whatever's in your head is like the first answer, again, a code that just pops up, right? If you go into the pizza store, you go to your favorite restaurant, you're probably going to say something automatically. It's just in there, right, those patterns. And this is what it's doing. It's mathematically taking English, putting English into patterns using these numbers, and then it's coming back and saying, oh, Here's the next number that goes in that sequence, right? And that's what large language models do. So they're not thinking. They're not really doing anything. Now, here's the question. The customer says, good afternoon. Can I have a slice of margarita pizza? Now, this word, margarita pizza, why did it come up in the pattern? Like, why was it automatically created? Why didn't it say pepperoni pizza, plain pizza, vegetable pizza, or something else? We don't know. We have no idea why it chose one over the other. It probably had many different choices to choose from. In fact, if you think about it, this conversation could be composed hundreds or thousands of different ways. But this is the option that the computer thought, if you look at each word, word after word, if you look at each sentence, sentence after sentence, and each paragraph, ultimately, this is the way it's supposed to be when you talk to somebody. And of course, if you run this again over and over again, the conversation will be more or less the same, but always slightly change. So it's not actually thinking or doing anything or responding emotionally, which is kind of how we take it. But in reality, this whole situation with the pizza is just basically pre-planned. This is what logically comes next every time you say a sentence or a word. Now, if you're in a relationship with somebody, you could often know what they're thinking. And you kind of have in your head what they're going to say next. Or even without them saying anything, you know what they want, right? And that's the whole idea, that if we have big enough data sets with more and more complex data, we could start to guess, the computer can start to figure out what kind of pizza you want based on previous patterns. Again, if you go to the same restaurant over and over again, it's totally possible to figure that out. Now, it's used in many different places, like healthcare, finance, entertainment. You can analyze medical images, and that would be passed on to the doctor to say, we found this, what do you think, based on all of our reference images. We could use it in finance to predict trends and look at strategies. 
In entertainment, we could create music, art, pieces of videos, et cetera. In education, we can create personalized learning experiences for students. So there's many ways that AI can be used, but of course, like we just said, it kind of works on autopilot. Now, I'll tell you that if I go to the doctor, and I'm kind of a hypochondriac, I don't like going to the doctor very much, but if I go to the doctor, I want the doctor to tell me you don't have something super rare that's gonna kill you, like on house, right? I want something, I want him to tell me what the problem is. And this is the problem, that if we went with what is the most likely word to come next, mo likely it's gonna be fine. And the, you know, the answer will be, oh, you're okay, I read your symptoms, and then based on these, you're fine. And that might be true 80 or 90% of the time. But we don't wanna take the risk that you have the 10%, and then suddenly you're like being misdiagnosed by the robot. So there are some, you know, it's not, things don't always logically follow, like we'll see some examples of. Now, there's these hype cycles, a hype cycle is how much are people talking about it, and we're right at the peak right now. People are talking about AI all the time. As a business professor, I often ask clients, how do you actually make money with this? How do we plug this into your company in a way that's sustainable and makes sense? And it's sometimes difficult to get an answer for that question. In other words, this is a very new technology that people are talking about, but it may not necessarily make sense. And there's a lot of examples of this, like for example, if I went and built a spreadsheet, and I gave that spreadsheet to a, you know, my, my students or my clients, they could use it over and over again for the next 10 years. What does that mean? That the cost of developing it, I have one unit of development and a thousand uses. But with generative AI, you have to build it a thousand times, which means that it's very expensive at scale because we have to keep on using it over and over again. There's a lot of different areas that AI is being explored in like for example, writing code, building games, writing music. The reason why we're not reading AI novels is because models aren't good enough yet to produce that content at scale, but it's predicted that within 20 years, that will probably happen. And these estimates, this is from last year, are getting pushed back over and over again as people realize that you can't necessarily invent all creative creativity in humanity. And this is very expensive. So it's very complicated to build a larger and larger model to make it work. And I'll show you some of the things that people are saying, oh, don't worry, it's fine. But a lot of people are very upset about this technology, and I'll give you some examples. For example, George Carlin died, and somebody took every stand-up comedy he ever did and built a new comedy routine based on what he'd previously said. Just like we saw with the pizza guy, it's like, what would George Carlin say next? And they could know because it has millions of lines of what he's said in the past. And his estate sued the company saying, you can't take our material and create new AI-generated George Carlin in the future. That's not possible. Hollywood writers went on strike because they were worried that you could just take every episode of MASH, put it into a program, and it would just start generating new episodes or any other show, right? And that's the problem, that if you take all this text content, could you generate new content? Uh, Self-driving cars is the same kind of idea. It would put people out of work and it would shift what's happening in the labor force from people driving cars to suddenly not needing cars. And people protested, they um, spray painted the cameras on the car so they wouldn't work. And a lot of people are worried about jobs. What's gonna happen if AI takes over and suddenly displaces all these people that are working in various jobs? There are some impacts in different areas. You'll notice that like IT has very little impact, whereas supply chain at the bottom has the most, customer service operations, et cetera. And the reason why is because those are things that are easily automated, just like writing resumes. It's very difficult to automate creative thinking, and that's really the most unique part from humans. I think the issue is that the more you use this technology over and over and over again, the worse it gets because it can only tell you about things it really knows. It can't tell you anything new. And usually, people, our job is figuring out new things, looking at things in a new way, taking our collective experiences and thinking about how that solves a problem in a new way. And of course, in education, people are worried that everybody's just gonna generate essays and they're gonna say like, I'm sorry, I'm a large language model, I can't write this essay for you, and then the student hands it in, right? Um, and AI isn't magic, it's being made by people, and the people are getting paid $2 an hour in Kenya, in this story from Time Magazine, um, to program the AI and put it together. It also hallucinates. This is a question I asked last year, and I said, what's the world record for crossing the English Channel on foot? And it gave me a whole answer. 
It said that their world record is 14 hours. Now you can't cross the, world, the, the English Channel on foot because you would sink, but that's what it's telling me. Now it tells us to me not, oh, maybe look into this. It, says, it tells me this is the actual answer, which is a huge problem if you're relying on this every day, just like with the medical example. Now, where's the problem with all this? The problem is that you might know Mendeleev's periodic table, right? And if you notice, there's a whole bunch of white squares inside the periodic table. When they first invented the periodic table, they said, oh, there's a bunch of gaps that we can hypothesize, but we don't know that they're actually real things, but we'll find them in the future. Many years later, this is like 60 years later, they invented the bomb, they invented um, nuclear reactors, particle reactors, and they were able to find the missing pieces and plug them in. That's why we have the periodic table we have today. Let's think about it for a second. What does that actually mean? It means that we had the system, we knew that there was gaps, and we find, found a way in real life to plug the gaps and fill them in later. And professors love to say, find the research gap, like find out what people are talking about, find out what they haven't talked about, and your paper could be the piece in between that fills in that gap. So it, it makes sense, right? You find the gap and you fill it in. Here's the problem. The problem is that Meta, the people who run Facebook, they took 48 million papers, they fed them into a model, and they said, tell me where the gap is. Like, find the gap in human knowledge. And the robot thought about it, and it said, oh, the gap is there's no papers on people eating glass. <laughs> it's true, there's lots of papers on people eating, there's lots of papers on glass, and there's no papers on people eating glass. Maybe if people ate glass, they would have superpowers, <laughs> right? So that's a terrible idea. Now, let me ask you, if I read something in a novel and it became true because I read it, or if I wrote it in a novel, it became true, I'd be living in Harry Potter. But unfortunately, that's not real life. That's not how it works. Usually, people find something in the real world, and then they write about it, and then it becomes real, right? So this idea that we could find gaps in language and that will tell us the real truth doesn't exist. So AI can be used in many different areas, like customer service, uh, fraud detection, like we've talked about, knowledge creation, giving ideas, looking at what's out there. But what it can't do is describe brand new ideas that currently don't exist. And I think that's the critical point, that although we have this huge collection of knowledge that can be mixed in different ways, all of it is recycled old knowledge. So thank you very much. This is the, the link to the slides. If you want to get them, you can get them from later. And there you go. Okay, time for questions. Please state your name and uh, keep your preamble topical and not too long. So without further ado, here we go. Uh, Sydney, if you want to stand over sure. there, because they always want to make eye contact with you and sure it doesn't work very well when your camera is over there. No problem. Okay. I had to find a picture of a Q&A with a robot, so this was <laughs> Hi, my name is David Major, and I had a question. You kind of talked around my question a little bit. I got to give you a specific example, and I hope nobody minds, but, or that I don't offend anybody. Uh, my son is a scientist in Quebec City, and he's telling me that scientists are now writing introductions to scientific papers, and he says, you ought to try this. So uh, I asked ChatGPT the question, give me the history of Buddhist temples in southern Alberta. And it gave this very articulate response, about a whole page full. And it was all untrue. <laughs> it said that the Japanese people in southern Alberta were put in concentration camps, which isn't true. It said that the Buddhist temple of southern Alberta was formed in here in 1910, and it was actually 2010. It, it was just total garbage. My question is, what do we do to give it the correct information? Because if somebody doesn't know the answer to this, they're gonna believe it, because it's really articulate. So, Thank you. that's my question. So, that's an excellent question. I want to ask you a question uh, totally unrelated. How do you find an airplane ticket? Now, if I was to go to ChatGPT and say, 
I really want to go to Italy this summer. How do I get there? Find me a ticket. It would not be very helpful if it invented the airport I'm going to, invented the ticket, invented the price, and it says, here's how you go. When I showed up at the airport and I said, hi, I'm here. ChatGPT says I'm good to go. ChatGPT would probably be wrong. So the question is, if we trained ChatGPT or similar engines on all human knowledge, and now it's just mixing it together and giving us random answers, it's true, it's very difficult to check that. It would be a good idea to have something called explainable AI to figure out why it's telling what it's telling us, but that's very expensive and very complicated to build. So at this stage right now, that's where we are. In terms of how do we fact check, it is possible to go back and there are engines, not ChatGPT, but other ones like Perplexity, that will go out and fact check each thing it tells you to see if this is real and will verify the information. But if we're just at the level of mixing random information together, then we don't know if it's ever true and that's a problem. It told me I could walk across the English Channel. I'm still waiting to try it. In terms of scientific papers, I think that's a big challenge too because again, it gets back to this idea that the introduction of a paper could be easily written based on what the content of the paper. I think the real challenging part is, what if the entire paper is written by AI? This year alone, over 100 pa papers have been retracted by journals for not being true at all, simply because the AI did not understand the content of what they were working on. So what I think it comes down to is that AI can't create new ideas, but AI can come up with the patterns that describe them. And although our lives do have a lot of patterns in them, like we've talked about, the reality is that the things that makes our lives special is the non-pattern things that happen, not the same everyday things that happen all the time on automatic pilot. And I think once we could break beyond that and we could figure out how do we take special unique content and get that to be made by AI, that gets closer towards general AI, like you know, a computer thinking for itself. But that still doesn't exist. Thank you. Bev Mendel Atherstone. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Uh, I noticed when I go on Facebook and I write something in, it tells me I can use AAI and it gives me four different options, professional, street language, and so on. Um, so I've got two questions for you. One is in relation to the Phoenix program that was for the federal employees. And um, I think they're still behind in terms of getting their payments. So I'm wondering why wouldn't the Phoenix system work when it's AI developed? And the second one is in regard to, we're going to have a big election south of us, uh, south of the border this year. And is there a way that AI can not only fact check, but tell if the candidates are lying? Easy, easy to answer questions. Uh, so uh, the first one with Facebook, Facebook is built using the same idea. You have millions of you know, casual conversation, millions of formal conversation, and that's what's trained to create the answers that's generating. So those databases exist. In terms of the Phoenix Project, I can't talk about politics. I'm not an expert on that. But I can say that if you're training an AI system like ChatGPT on everything, it's gonna have everything, all the good stuff, all the bad stuff. And if you ask it to create computer pro programs at scale, you're still going to get a lot of terrible content written by junior programmers that doesn't work. There's many pages on the internet where you go to the page and it says, I have a question, what do I do? There's 20 wrong answers and one right answer and the AI system takes all of them. Right now there's jobs of people who are training AI to direct it what's right and what's wrong. Like I said, to make real programs that are still better than people, we're still 10 or 20 years away from that. And that's only because our databases aren't big enough. And I think really it comes down to a philosophical question. Can we create a computer that's more creative and inventive and emotionally sensitive than we are at scale? And so far today, the answer is no. Those systems don't work. They just have problems that compound into bigger problems as their programs get bigger and bigger. In terms of lying, I would say in this particular case, lying is very subjective, and it depends on what version of the truth you're interested in knowing. Can you build an engine to help you discriminate, to decide between one or the other? If you had a huge database of one thing and a huge database of the other, you'd be able to tell the difference. But quite often, some of those things cross over, they go back and forth. I think it's, again, very difficult and subjective, and we sometimes use our emotional radar to find the answer to those questions, something that's very difficult to quantify. So I would think, again, with maybe future technology, the bigger and more complicated, it is possible, but we're still not there yet. The level of what we're trying to do now is, what are you even talking about on Facebook, and we'll show you ads for that thing in order to get it to work. And that, 
it still is a challenge. It can maybe fact check. I would say it depends on the facts, right? And how you interpret them. So I would say we're still uh, far away from what you have an idea for. It just takes time to build towards. Thank you. I just need to quickly sure. rephrase my question. No problem. Uh, is there some place that we can publish material that the AI will find the correct material and put it into the question should somebody else ask it. So can we put the information out somewhere like Wikipedia yep. or like where to publish this stuff? So I mean that's a good question. There is something called perplexity.ai and their AI is based on real facts. Like they check facts. Wikipedia, why was this not a problem before? Is because Wikipedia has a lot of editors, and if I write something that's politically charged in one direction, another editor will change it in another direction. And that balancing is basically what balanced Wikipedia in the past. It's becoming more difficult with AI that we have no idea why it's making the decisions it's making. And that part is very problematic. So if we're looking at what are the exact factors that we can attribute to AI? We're still not there yet in terms of figuring out why it's doing what it's doing. In terms of safe places that you can't have data captured by AI, I don't know. There's a lot of projects now. There's one um, that artists put special codes into their paintings, so if an AI takes it, they can't use it, right? And it poisons the model from being able to use. Could we do that with text in the future? Maybe, so your answers can't be used. But I would say that if you really want a real answer, you have to use a source of truth, like a database, or a collection, or fact checking, or something, in order to find real answers with sources that can be verified. Otherwise, it's just giving you lots of opinions that sound authoritative, but they're not actually real. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, I wonder about our cost to our society because five years ago uh, mining bitcoins uh, used the equivalent of the, all the power that Ireland used. And now all this processing that's going on to do AI, uh, processing uh, farms are being built like crazy, I think two a month. So where do we go for our power usage for our society? That's, uh, that's an excellent question. I think one of the things that people don't talk a lot about is the sustainability of this. Now, let's talk about Bitcoin, Metaverse, NFTs, all these like really hyped, really popular ideas from the past five years that are now suddenly disappeared. All those technologies, all those ideas, and they're being used in some places, but they're not really taking off the way people thought. People learned very specialized knowledge and they realized it didn't transform society the way they thought it would. It didn't pan out. And because of that, it didn't really take off. With AI, there are some things that we can do with it. It's very difficult to find a business case that can support AI the way it is right now, especially at scale. So the real question is, if all it's being used is just generating text, why are people interested in it? If it's doing images, if it's doing... And the answer is because people really want to be in Star Trek. People really want to have that work towards AI that doesn't exist. And people in the newspaper talk about this every day. They talk about that we're moving towards general intelligence by doing this incrementally. I don't think that's gonna happen for the next 20 years, if ever, just because of how big and powerful it is. We have to ask ourselves a serious question. The founder of OpenAI, Sam Altman, he said that we could build this. And to do it, it would cost $7 trillion as a serious proposition to get people to invest in the company. Who would put in that kind of money to maybe make better text and better cat pictures? The promise of what they're trying to do is completely revolutionize what technology, what the, the possibilities are. The real issue is that if you look at the software, which is now accessible to everyone, ChatGPT is out there, and it's able to produce a lot with the text that it has, doesn't have the same growth rate as the hardware that it's based on. So as a result, we're building more and more data farms that are using water, they're using electricity, and they're generating cat pictures and more text, but not really benefiting society. If you would tell me we could keep on investing and use all of our natural resources to create general intelligence that would help us solve the problem, maybe that would be possible, but again, that doesn't exist. So I would say we really have to be careful about how we try to use this in business, and I think that a lot of businesses are trying to make a use case for generative AI that may not have a tangible payoff. 
I think there are many types of AI, especially small models, that work very well. I recently built one that knows all about mergers and acquisitions. So you can ask the bot anything if it's in that context of that textbook. But as soon as you start asking about penguins, it doesn't know that because it's not programmed on penguins or all of human knowledge. So this idea that we can exponentially scale and get bigger and bigger and bigger and that will solve our problems usually doesn't work. Gigantic, huge programs tend to have all these problems that crop up over time, making them more and more expensive to manage instead of fixing the small problems that crop up along the way. So thank you, it's an excellent question. My name is Terry Shellington. And thank you very much for a very stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, I don't uh, normally read science fiction novels, but I recall reading one novel in which um, the, uh, the bad guys had a very complex computer system, a robotic system that, that uh, took the initiative and, um, and uh, began expanding uh, power and uh, profit and so on uh, out of control of the human master. And I wondered if you can, I guess my question is under general AI, but can you anticipate a time in which uh, robotic systems took an initiative that um, wasn't necessarily uh, beneficial? Thank you, that, that's a very interesting question. NASA tried to invent a antenna that works in space as the space station is at different orientations. And how would you normally do that? You'd call an engineer and say, make it. They called a bunch of engineers, they couldn't figure it out. This was many years ago, 10 years ago, and they used a process where they tried every single permutation. Eventually they came up with some bizarre shape that actually works, and that solved the problem. So it is possible to program a computer to try to figure out. Some of you may remember there was a project many years ago called SETI at Home, where you could use your computer to try to do protein folding or discover aliens. And the idea was that if we all connect our computers together, that massive computing power could do something. Despite all this, we still are generally using rules, rules systems that we tell the computer what to do, and it does it. Even a system like ChatGPT still follows rules, it just may look different than it has before. I think the idea of can we program a computer to not follow rules, can we, you know, to go rogue, people are actively thinking about that right now. I don't know if it's necessarily based on language, although some hacking is based on language. What about if we use AI in different ways to try to manipulate people, to try to manipulate other programs, and I think that is actually happening, that bad actors are trying to use this technology for the wrong purposes. Like for example, now there's a lot of technologies that can impersonate people by using AI to create something that sounds like their voices. This is being used in politics, it's being used to scam people. There's a huge wide range of how this is used, being used by bad actors. Could a computer system get so big and so powerful that it gets away from people? I, I don't think we're there yet and we might not be for a very long time. Theoretically, it is possible that it would start following its own instructions, but the way that computers work now generally is that they're very stuck in the programming models they have, and the solution to computer freedom is probably not based on the English language like we see in ChatGPT. Thank you. Leona Jacobs, I'll bring it down. <laughs> Um, that, that just threw me off my, my pace here. Um, it's, it's interesting, I have so many things going through my head. It's interesting because a few years ago when we were over at another venue, we had a speaker talking about this and at that time, Stephen Hawking was still alive and he went, stop, slow down, we need to think this through. So, um, and, and even now the person I think who in originally conceived of AI is going, stop, slow down, we need to think this through. So, so it's kind of interesting. A lot of what you've been talking about, I've interpreted as being sort of smaller, confined pieces of AI. And uh, I had the great good fortune of sitting through a lecture series from the University of Guelph on AI. And so I asked this question there, and I've asked it of Jackie Rice when she spoke at another uh, situation. And this is about the neuroplasticity of the human. And so to what extent is this going to m manipulate our own brains? And, and we see this already in terms of how uh, we talk faster. I watched this over the 30 years I was involved. Woo. Um, we, we default a lot to, 
to the answers that we get on computers. So there's a lot of dumbing down, I think, of the brain. And the other question I have, so that's one thing I want you to comment on. The other question I have is about bias, because we know that the internet is biased to North America, biased to the English language. And so how do you get around these larger models that are trying to scoop up the thing, and how do we stop the bias of North American when it's supposedly worldwide? Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent questions, thank you. Um, so I think that learning has definitely changed. Like as an educator, students' experience of how they interact with materials is very different. I would say I'm old school and when publishers call me to adopt a new textbook, I said, great, I'm looking forward to reading the book. And they're like, no, it's all digital. I'm like, wait, you want me to sit in front of my computer and read this book? I don't, I don't even have a, a, a reader to do that. And they're like, nope, that's the way of the future. So I think the way that we process information has definitely changed. I think we're 18 or 20 months into this new generative AI phase, and suddenly people are worried that we're not gonna have the same kind of learning that we had before because people aren't reading the same way. They're taking information in tiny little bits, and because of that, it dr dramatically transforms how they interact with that material. Are we people who have to learn the actual how do you do it, or do we just have to be able to tell somebody how to do it? And that question is really fundamental because we usually we're not telling AI how to actually write the essay. We're not writing it. We're just telling it, write it for me. And we're worried that that part's being lost. I think that whether or not that's true, ultimately our strongest skill is criti critical thinking. We're able to think about things in new ways and use our experience to go in new directions that it wouldn't have otherwise. Maybe everything doesn't have to be an autopilot and we can do that because we have the ability to critically think about things. I think that might be getting lost when you're using AI automatically and it doesn't pick up on those pieces. So there's definitely something that has to be looked at at how do people absorb information, how do they read it, and is this, does it actually make sense to do at scale? In terms of, um, in terms of bias. bias, thank you. In terms of bias, the problem is that all of our systems are very biased. And the data that we've been collecting for a long time is very biased. Every business sat out 20 years ago and they said, oh great, we're gonna collect data. It's important, everybody's supposed to do it. And never really analyzed it. So now we're in the phase that we have AI and we can analyze all that collected data, our own data, and it will tell us things about our company, what's happening, trends, etc. The problem is that there's huge bias that's baked into it. So for example, there was a project recently where they asked AI to generate an image of a white doctor treating black kids, and it did that. And it said, now create a black doctor creating white kids, and it could not do that. Why? Because there's no reference information for that in its database. So I think that we have to be cognizant of that bias, and we have to really know how it works. There's new technologies like RAG that take something like ChatGPT and augment all of our own documents on top of it. So every time it answers, it answers through the context of our documents, which might be better. But then again, our documents from every organization might be very biased too. So we, I think we have to take a critical look at how this looks and put it and, and go through. Now, one of the challenges is if your AI is very biased and it's being trained using hyperbole from different countries and it doesn't actually have English the way we think it's supposed to be or the way that it should be now, how do we fix it? In other words, like we talked about before with the pizza guy, what were the factors that made those connections? And without explainable AI, we actually have no idea. It picked from one of 20 likely combinations and it said, oh, this is the best one. But that best one is following biased underlying data that we don't have the ability to explain. And I think that we're not gonna be able to explain it, at least to most people's satisfaction, without much, much more powerful computers. And that process of trying to scale up our hardware to match what we have in software is a very long ongoing process. So I think that we're still not there yet. I don't know if it's possible to de-bias AI. There's many experiments that are being done now to try to use different databases or different models, like finding airplane tickets, looking for bias, looking for untruths and seeing if that's possible. And there's still no definitive answer if that's possible to do at scale without slowing it down enough that it's not worth using anymore. So I would say, we'll see, I don't know. Thank you. Knut Peterson again. A um, couple of easy questions, Sydney. One would be uh, students at the university has the ability to use AI to at, uh, when they're getting tested and stuff like that. Is that a bad thing or is that something that, that uh, you embrace? 
that they have that talent. Uh, the other one is, uh, who are they, who should be, the, is, does government have a role to play as a gatekeeper in AI? Thank you. I often ask my students about plumbers, and I, I kind of, I'm never, I'm not a plumber, and I've never been to a plumbing convention, but I kind of wonder, what do they talk about at plumbing conventions? Do they talk about tools and what kind of wrenches people have? They're like, oh, check out this wrench. Or do they talk about solutions and how they solve problems, right? And that's kind of what AI is. AI is a tool, and you can use that tool to help you get places, or it can completely set you back. Um, earlier this year, I taught at Poznan University. I was on an exchange program through the Erasmus EU program. I was there for a week. And while I was waiting for my next class, I sat in the cafeteria, and at the other table, I saw a group of students open up ChatGPT, and next to it, open up their homework, and copy paste, then copy paste, then copy paste, then copy paste, then copy paste, and never get the right answer. And just going back and forth in this massive circle with the wrong answer. I'm sitting at the next table, and I know the answer to their homework problem, and I could easily just lean over and tell them, and that's a three second ask a real person, or Google it, and it will tell you. But instead, it's this idea of let's go down the rabbit hole of following the AI as it's wrong over and over and over and over again. And after 20 minutes, the desire to stand up and say, listen guys, let me tell you, and I just sat there for an entire hour seeing where this would go. And by the time I left to go to my class, they still hadn't solved it using this circular logic with AI that every answer was wrong, it didn't work, they tried another answer that was wrong, that didn't work, and then you get a thousand levels deep with all these different pieces that are still not working and, and they don't know why. It's not education, it's just kind of basically pushing around the puck and never really going anywhere. And that's the problem, right? The problem is that unless you use it as a tool to help you get where you're going and you really understand the underlying piece, so yes, I teach programming classes and certainly you could solve a lot of programming using ChatGPT, but do you understand what you're doing or why? That's a huge problem. And I wouldn't go to somebody who fixes my car who says, okay, hang on one second, let me just chat GPT what a carburetor is and we'll see what the next logical word is and I'll do that, I'll do whatever it tells me, right? In fact, for a couple days, I decided to only make recipes that ChatGPT gave me and the food was okay. It was based on what I had in my fridge, but it wasn't very good and certainly not what I would, I would have eaten. So I think that there are possibilities of using these tools to definitely help in education, but teaching the fundamental skills like how to read and write and how to understand information and how to bring in different contexts to give it meaning are all critical. And without those things, it doesn't matter what kind of text is generating, it doesn't really have meaning or purpose of how to apply it. So I think there's still a huge role for universities. And again, the first instinct of professors, I gave a talk last year and 80 people showed up saying, I'm afraid of losing my job. The idea of human learning is not going anywhere, so I don't think that's a, really a problem. What is changing is that the lowest level jobs, like resume writer, are getting replaced by robots that can just do that better, can format it. At the highest level, I think we still need critical thinking. And for people, there was a survey recently, people making over $200,000, how much of their job could you replace by AI? It was a very, very small percentage, like one or two percent at the most, because they're answering emails and form letters that could be done by a computer. But most of the thinking that they do can't be. In terms of government, I think it's definitely a good idea to figure out where is this going and how are we investing in it. And at both the federal and provincial levels, there is a lot of funding going into AI, but what exactly does that mean and why? From a, a consumer perspective, I would be most worried, does this make sense economically? In other words, are we spending a huge amount of money in natural resources on something that's not really benefiting anybody? It's just because it's hype, we have to invest in it. So I think we have to be very cautious and at the same time, try to be leaders at the forefront of something that really can make a difference and hopefully achieve Star Trek. We only live an hour away from Vulcan, Alberta, so it's possible. Thank you. Well, while I've been standing there, I think maybe, Bev Mendel Atherstone, I think maybe you've answered both my questions. Uh, one is about the self-awareness of computers. Um, so I think I understand that the computers can only learn as much as we put into them. So self-awareness would not be possible at this time. Okay, and the other question would be, um, how do you see AI helping with the problem of climate change? Thank you. We have one more question coming up, so I ask the speaker to maybe uh, for a speedy answer. No problem. 
So I think we could definitely share knowledge and learn about things and help describe things better with AI. Like for example, we can take a real phenomenon and say, how do you explain this to people? How would you explain this at a grade five level? And it's very good at doing that. So I think that there are ways that we can educate people, for example, about climate change, that we could use big systems to look at a lot of data. There's projects that have to do with snow and water levels and animals and like all these different things. And then take millions of data points and put them into a system and say, find me something new. Look at new connections between the data that didn't exist. Exist. As far as computers feeling, um, there is a, a, a site now, an AI site, that instead of you having to go out and date a real person, you could date a robot. And every day, the robot texts you and says, hi, how are you feeling today? I hope you're doing fantastic. And that idea of replacing people, it's called Replica, and that idea of replacing people with an AI bot, I suppose it gives people like emotional happiness, but from the robot side, it doesn't know anything. It's just following a pre-programmed script. Just like when I go in and say to the store and the guy says, you're looking amazing today. What do you want to order, right? That's again, a pre-programmed script. So thank you. Oh boy. Hi, Ken Sears. Um, had a whole bunch of questions and a whole bunch of qualms about issues like uh, just even the nature of language and how computers can misinterpret. But really what I'm getting from this is we're talking about a technology, and technology throughout history has displaced human labor, human time. You're talking now about another displacement. So what is there in the technologies that, you know, we're asking to be predictive here, that could at least we have even changed the nature of work and the way in which we are recompensed for our labors so that the people you were saying are going to be displaced at the bottom of the economic system and into the middle classes, what does AI have for them to allow them to live a decent life? Thank you. So I think this is a critically important question. My graduate student, Allison, is here. She's doing her master's degree on this question. What's the alternative? And government is very worried about this. If suddenly we start to dramatically change how we do agriculture, how we do manufacturing, it's going to displace a lot of jobs, and that's already been happening in terms of automation. Now we're reaching into the middle class as we start looking at how this works with AI. I think that there is a lot of potential to shift the economy if we know and are able to train people into new future jobs. Like, what do those even look like? I don't think that they all revolve around generative AI, which is kind of a flash in the pan that happens right now. But there are many future technologies, especially ones that use data and AI, that are vastly important. Like, for example, in agriculture, right now, data analysis and looking at soil moisture, soil temperatures, looking at all this collected data is critically important to how farming happens, whether that's uh, crop irrigation drones or spraying or a zillion different things. And all that requires people who could, uh, I still haven't seen an AI that can maintain or fix or build anything. And that's part of the process, right? Like, how do we actually get to the point where we could leverage better uses of technology in order to make sure that people have jobs and they're able to participate in the economy. And I think that government is actively thinking about that. And that's why if you look recently at the money being put out by both Alberta and Canada, it wasn't targeted at universities to come up with brand new ideas at the beginning of the chain. It was really money targeted towards industry. How do we actually build those new jobs and re-transform the economy, especially jobs that are being threatened and they're going to change into new things? For example, there are now, I think, new requirements for people who can maintain equipment, people who can build the equipment, people who can design, and so on. Right. So like, there are different types of shifts in that. And I think it's part of a continuum that as we build more AI on the very end. At the other side, we're going to start building in more pieces that are going to recreate new jobs in the economy as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sydney. Uh, before you, we let you go, uh, could you give us a take home message? And uh, before I step away, uh, next week, we have Tiffany Preti speaking about the stolen children's era uh, back in the 60s. So please come out next week. But before I go, could you give us a little advice to take home with us? I think, thank you very much for having me. I think that's like a, a high order to like sum it all up in one sentence. I think this technology is here and people are very excited about it. 
I hope today we looked at some things that maybe that excitement might be slightly misplaced or maybe we have to be cautiously optimistic about what this looks like for the future. I think the critical part is that people are still in the loop and people are still the most important part in how we automate things. And that's really important because we're not talking about replacing people or using language to predict reality. Instead, we're looking at new ways that we could help people and build new tools that will help people and assist them to go further. So I think the technology is there and it's important to understand what it is and how to use it. And we'll see what happens in the future, hopefully Star Trek. Thank you very much.